character development in storytelling. Why does character development matter in a story at all? Why, why do we have that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going, I brought a visual aid. What's up, Story Geeks? I'm Jay Shear, and on this video, Caleb Monroe and I are gonna talk a little bit more about character development, why it matters in stories, how to do it, and what resources and tools we like to use relative to character development. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button for me. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you've got questions along the way as we go through, make sure you leave those questions down in the comments below, and we'll try and answer those questions for you. Let's dig deeper into character development character development in storytelling and the first question like i like i asked you when we talked about uh, structure was uh, basically like why does character development de development matter in a story at all why why do we have that mm -hmm. um i'm going i brought a visual aid so oh, nice. <laughs> i could not find i could not get a good version uh, cause I could only, I only have Kindle right now where I'm staying and the graphic in the Kindle version of the book is so tiny. Um, <laughs> but there's this book by Vicki King mm. called how to write a movie in 21 days. Oh, nice. And despite the insanely hucksterish sounding title, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when someone tells me they want to write their first movie, that and Steven Pressfield do the work are the only mm. two books I give them. And I, nice. and I tell I tell them don't do any don't read other things read these and then start, mm. and because what those two books do so well is they actually describe what it feels like to write the screenplay, mm. not what needs to go on this page and this page. Mm. Um, so Vicky talks about you know she's like around page sixty five you're going to suddenly get a cold, or uh, <laughs> you know around page around page forty five you're going to suddenly have an idea for another movie and it's going to feel more important than the one you're in the middle of. Uh, she she goes through like and she's like your family's gonna be reacting this way when you're at this part of the story and <laughs> um, and like ways to keep yourself motivated and and engaged and Pressfield's do the work is the same thing it's the emotional mm -hmm. journey of taking something through beginning middle and end mm -hmm. and I think that's actually what writers need mm -hmm. is they need they need to understand the emotions that they're going to go through because that is not being prepared for that is the thing that derails most projects it's not yeah. skill. Um, mm. because skill can be learned, mm. uh, you can, and you can always pick up a, a book and you can always learn story structure, but I honestly don't think you need to, I think you just need to consume stories and tell stories and you tell mm. stories over and over again and you keep getting better at it. Mm. You just have to know that when you're feeling this certain way at this point in the story, that it's okay. Mm. Um, mm. You need to know that the way you, that you, that you may think you just wrote the worst five pages in the history of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you need to know that your emotions and the quality of your work have no relationship whatsoever. Mm. Um, I'll have those days and I'm like, that was just the, that's just the worst drivel that anyone has ever vomited onto a page in my life. But then when, when people are reading the work later, those are the pages that they don't want me to change because those mm. are the ones that works the best. So it's like, oh, so my emotion had absolutely no bearing on how good it was or how bad it was. And it works the other way. Sometimes I'm like, that is the most brilliant fight scene I have ever written in my life. <laughs> and that's, that's the only thing that the editor wants changed. <laughs> wow. Um, you, know, you know what I mean? So uh, just knowing that how you feel is, mm. is going to have all sorts of ups and downs and eddies and dead ends, but yeah. it actually doesn't reflect, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't reflect the quality of the thing you're producing. You just mm. need to keep producing. Mm -hmm. um, and what's great about writing, unlike some art forms, mm. is every time you do it, you are also practicing it. <laughs> so <laughs> the, you know, practice, the best way to learn to write is to write mm. and just keep doing it over and over and over again. Um, mm. And so it, I'm getting to, to why I brought this book up, but she, she does Sid Field in four pages. And I'm like, that's really all people need. They just need four <laughs> pages, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so, but she had this great diagram in there that has stuck with me ever since I first read this book. I don't even know, 20 years ago. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and she, so here's one of the pictures. <laughs> nice, oh, nice. I like she, it. She's like, we think of story structure as some sort of scaffolding that our character climbs around on. Right, right, right. She's like, but story structure actually is character. Ah, um, they're the same thing. Nice. And I think that's a really key 
I think when I think about why does character development matter, it's because mm. you don't have a story without it. You don't, mm. it's, your structure doesn't work if nothing happens to your character. Mm. Um, Cause plot alone is not interesting. <laughs> right. um, you know, it's the, it's the emotions created within plot and the transformation and the moments sure, uh, sure. that plot allows for that are interesting. And any moment that transform your character will change your story. And any mm. moment that transforms your story will change your character. Mm. Um, so I think we, we split them apart a lot, but mm. I think they're actually the same thing. Mm. Um, so I think that they, they are important for the same reasons. Yeah, I'm actually glad you said that because uh, it's interesting because when I first started in writing, and just like you, this is like two decades ago, um, I did start to think through like, well, what is the plot? And I used to plot everything out. A lot of times now, I'll say like, well, yeah, these things are happening, but I'll actually take the the character development and put that on top of the structure and be like, this is technically the story, is this character's development. Mm -hmm. There are things that are going to happen, but I'm more interested in where the characters are at at what points in time than I am in where the plot's at at what point in time. You know what I mean? So I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and I like that. I like that, that why. So I will, I will give two caveats to where I think character development is a little bit different. And I want to run those by you, but I'll get to yeah. those last. Cause in my mind, one of the reasons why, uh, character development is so important. Like we're asking this question, why is it so important? In my mind, stories are the pinnacle of effective communication. Because stories do something that narratives, I love that we're using these words, right? Mm -hmm. Narrative being the, like you talked about, um, just the, the, the expression of, of life, but without a story associated with it. But stories are the most effective for, form of communication, and I think it's because it engages the whole person. So when a person engages in, in a good story, um, they'll find meaning They'll find emotional meaning. They'll go through a set of emotions. They'll react physically because of some of those emotions. It engages them mentally and I think even spiritually. Mm -hmm. um, and so then understanding, interpretation, and meaning can be achieved. So if I just go through a narrative, you go, okay. <laughs> but if I go through a story, you go, oh, I think I might need to change the way I think about that, right? Like it's, there's a difference. There's a difference there. Mm -hmm. um, and so because I think, now this is getting really esoteric, in regards to character development, but oh, I can get all sorts of esoteric. So maybe you know, we'll <laughs> we might that. go there. We might have to go there. <laughs> but I think the because the existence of humanity is uh, in in many regards a mystery to us. We 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 start off. We don't know why we're here. We don't know how we how the human race came about exactly. There's all these theories about how it came out. That makes us hungry for stories because stories shape our perception of what's real and what's true. And so we're kind of just hungry to engage in these stories because we go, I have to find a meaning for what is, um, and I'm going to find it through storytelling. And so I was thinking about this earlier today. I was thinking about like, okay, well, we're surrounded by information. And then like what you're saying is we're surrounded by narratives. And when you're sitting, you go, information is everywhere. I can look around, I can see the trees. I can look around and see cars and the cars are moving. Um, but what isn't readily available is why those things are there. Why is that car there today? Is the person going to work? Are they going to the store? Why are they going to the store today? Um, they're supposed to be on quarantine, <laughs> whatever. Um, and so I think that we are trying to emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually ask the question of why. And stories can give us insights into why. So I think that that's why character development is so important because we as human beings are trying to get better. We're trying to develop. We're trying to understand and interpret the world around us. Um, and stories can help us actually do that, whereas narratives don't. And so character development then is part of the storytelling experience. Um, here's, what I want, here's where I want to run some caveats by you and see mm -hmm. if you agree or see if you can get a better... Um, a better understanding of it <laughs> but uh i think that there are a couple types of stories wherein we find a lot less character development and i think that first of all there's there's no such thing i don't somebody said this recently and i i have not found a way to break this rule but there's no story without characters so you might make a lamp a character you might make a uh an animal a character or something but you care stories don't exist without characters and they're about characters dealing with 
conflict in some way. The only time I don't think, and maybe this is a better conversation for our character arcs um, discussion that we'll have after this, but I don't know that there are some types of like mystery stories. They don't have a lot of character development. And I'll talk about that later when we talk about arcs. But even like Indiana Jones and franchise stories, we just want to see that character inter interacting and engaging with uh, a different scenario, but there's not a lot of development. So it's those stories are kind of interesting. It's like they are playing with different rules almost. Do you have any thoughts about that? Sort of. Um, seri series stories versus standalone stories are different in that a standalone story is the most important thing that's ever happened to that person. That's why that story is being told. Yeah. In a series, it's a it's it's right there in the word. It's a series of interest of important stories to this character. Mm. Mm. And so, if we know it's a series, which almost all mysteries are, which is why yeah, sure. which, is, which is why we, <laughs> I think that's why you honed in on that particular genre. But if it's a series, we don't require the same depth of character change because mm. we know that we're going to be living with this person for years. Mm. And, and we have an expectation that they are going to change the same way the real people in our life who we've lived with for years change, mm. which just means like a little, a little bit at a time. <laughs> right. So you have to resolve something in every story, but it doesn't have, if it's an episodic story, if it's an ongoing story, if it's a series, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It just has to be, they've grown a little bit as a person mm. and they, they, as they keep doing that. Um, and because our expectations are different when we know there's another chapter coming when we know that we're going to be with this person for a while, mm. uh, especially if we're picking up book one and there's 17 books already in the series. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we don't have an expectation that boy, things better just like have <laughs> like this first, this character needs to go through thesis, antithesis, and synthesis <laughs> synthesis in this story. You know, um, you know, you can take 10 books to do each of those. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Well, this will be, this will be my, uh, my special uh, call out to, um, to the next video in this series because there is i do think mysteries actually play with something in a in a way that i think is really fascinating so i'll get to that but but with character development how, how do you approach that as a writer how do you approach character development what's your process surrounding you know what are these characters going to do and how they're going to change and all that kind of stuff how, how do you go about that um so this is the answer to this is kind of also the answer to the character art question. So I might be giving mm. you some editing mm. difficulties, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, why not? Why not? Um, you both? Well, I guess so. First, I'll answer this two ways. Mm. Um, so one is your character is there to test hypotheses. Mm. So um, we ask, as you were saying, we ask why, mm -hmm. and then a story attempts to say because. And, right. <laughs> um, and are you are you familiar with something called the Barnum effect? It's a uh, no, I'm not. I don't. I feel like I should be, but I don't know that one. It's a psychological term. It's named after P.T. Barnum. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's it, the Barnum effect is this, and I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's the it's how it's the it's the word used to describe the language of horoscopes tarot readings, mm. astrology, the mm. Myers-Briggs personality test, the Enneagram. Because mm. mm. uh, none of these nece necessarily have any sort of scientific backing that there's any accuracy to them. In fact, there's often tests in the other direction. <laughs> but they're, they're framed in such a way, this is why it's named after P.T. Barnum and all of the, the, you know, the exaggerations he would make, claims and stuff to get people sucked into the circus. Uh, but they're fr they're so vague that the person hearing them needs to interpret them. Mm. And in that interpretation, it ends up becoming a personal experience for them. And so they feel, oh, yeah, that was said directly to me. Mm. Um, but it's actually the way that they are interpreting and digesting this really vague thing that is mm. the personal thing to them. Mm. And so I think I think the Barnum effect is actually very useful to us as human beings. <laughs> Uh, so all of those things that I just talked about, I, I'm not particularly down on any of them. Mm. Um, the, uh, just because I think that the way that a horoscope or the way the Enneagram works is through the Barnum effect doesn't mm. mean I don't think it's not incredibly useful. Right. Um, because once you realize that the Barnum effect is taking place, then everything anyone says, you, you, you think, is that true? 
Right. <laughs> is that right. true for me or not true right. for me? And if it is true for me, in what way is it true for me? Mm. And you will often get conclusions you would have not reached on your own because they're talking about things that are just not the way your brain works. You know, it's an outside. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. And um, side note, aside from aside from being a writer, I also uh, have a career. I work for a church in Hollywood where I uh, I oversee artist communities. Mm, mm. And uh, the church in America is going through this phase right now where you can't go through a conversation with anyone without them telling you what their Enneagram type is. And, um, <laughs> <It's so true. laughs> um, that's awesome. um, but that's Barnum effect too. You know, like right. someone in church would never have anything to do with astrology or horoscopes or tarot cards, but yeah. the Enneagram is the, ex is the exact same thing. It's, um, you know, right. the, the Zodiac is 12 categories and the Enneagram is nine. <laughs> and it's, um, and it's, it's um, and what what I find particularly fascinating is that the Enneagram started in Sufism, which is a whole other religion, hmm. and then yeah. it was spent spent some time being practiced by Hermetic Christians, which are basically hmm. Christians, um, <laughs> and they are the ones who, around the turn of the 20th century, created the tarot as we tend to use it now. Hmm. Um, so if you told most Christians that this number that they quote about themselves constantly was developed by Sufis and magicians, they <laughs> right. would, like, their brains would explode. <laughs> right. uh, but all this to say, it still can be useful for people to understand how they interact with the world and how others mm. interact with them. Mm. Um, so I think stories work something like the Barnum effect, mm. where you are saying, in your story, you are saying because. Mm. And the point is not for your because to necessarily be true. Mm. Uh, the point is that you and your audience then have to test it. Is mm. it true? And if it is true, how is it true? Mm. Um, and I, I, so I think, I think that's why stories are crucial. And so I, in, in that regard, your characters and your story are kind of, it's a, it's, they're there to test hypotheses. Yes. Um, and so a character will face situations that would only be hypothetical to you, right? but they have, but they have to make a concrete choice. Right. What do I think is most important right now? Mm. You know, do I, do I save the baby going over the cliff or do I stop the train with 10 people from exploding? Mm. And they have to make a choice. And in making that choice, they are posing a hypothesis about what might be more important. And you as an audience have to either accept that hypothesis or reject it. Mm. And so, that's kind of how I think about what characters are there for and what their relationship is with us as, um, as an audience, but also as writers, because we're kind of their audience too. Yeah. Um, you can't talk to any serious writer for very long before they say, yeah, I was trying to do this and my character wouldn't do it. Exactly. Uh, you, you said it earlier, you know, yeah, and, exactly. um, and it's, it's a weird phenomenon uh, because your characters are not necessarily alive, but I think what's going on there is you're, it's your subconscious telling mm. you that you're about to take a wrong step in the story. Mm. Mm. Um, so our conscious minds can process something like 260 pieces of information at a discrete at a, at a time, mm. you know, so that's color, movement, smell, sight, sound, location, all of those sort of things. Mm. Your subconscious can digest. I don't remember the exact number, but it's in the millions. So, wow. Your subconscious is processing way more information than your conscious mind is. <laughs> right. And in, in your subconscious, all these things are brewing. And I think what, what is happening is there's this act of emergence going on. Um, mm. uh, if you're not familiar with emergence, it's when something is more than the sum of its parts. Mm. So um, like beehives are, and ant colonies are great examples of emergence. They actually, if you took one ant and you added up what they could do, it's way less than what happens when you put a bunch of them together. There's this um, act of emergence where there where something larger than the sum of its parts emerges when they are all together oh, uh, cool. in, in relationship. And information works that way too. Um, mm. Emergence is talked about as an information science type of thing. It's like you have enough data points, something starts to emerge out of it kind of on its own. Uh, this is how fractals, I believe this is how fractals work uh, mm. in math. Um, so what I think is happening is your subconscious is digesting more about your characters than, than you are. Mm. And something is starting to emerge. And the, mm. thing that, the thing that is emerging is essentially the personality of your character. And your subconscious 
it feels like your character is telling you, but it's really just your <laughs> it's yourself saying, nope, we know that this is not, this is not right. This, this, right. this, this, this has emerged in a different direction. This is not what this person should be doing. It will feel inconsistent. Mm. Um, so I think part of what you are doing with your stories is you're giving your subconscious free reign mm -hmm. by treating your characters. Now this is, probably very, this is personal to me. It may not work for mechanics. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah. But by treating them as real people. Yeah. Uh, if I treat them as real and I ask them what they would do, then mm. what I'm really doing is giving my subconscious a chance to weigh in. Um, and my subconscious is a better storyteller than my conscious brain. Mm. Uh, and so treating them like a real pe having respect for them, you know, mm. uh, there's, a, I, I recently read an interview for beasts of the Southern wild. Um, by Manola Dar Dargis, Dargis, Manola, mm. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, and she was reviewing Beasts of the Southern Wild for the New York Times. Mm. And she said, it's hauntingly beautiful, both visually and in the tenderness that it shows to its characters. So mm. even in the review, she's talking about them as real and the story is doing things to them and, and mm. treating them in a certain way. Um, Ron Austin, a, a writer who has had a huge effect on me, um, mm. He wrote an es an a seminal essay called The um, Spiritual Frontiers of Film, which oh, has wow. influenced generations of, of writers and filmmakers. And uh, he also wrote a book called In a New Light. And in his book, In a New Light, he talks about the only way that you can create storytelling that your audience will receive mm -hmm. and respect is if you tell stories that res are respectful of your characters. If you respect mm -hmm. your characters in the act of telling their story, Mm. Um, uh, and, and recently I had the, the opportunity, the incredible opportunity to host a conversation between Ron Austin, um, and another producer, writer, director, showrunner named Scott teams, who was very influenced by Ron Austin. And they were talking about this That's and cool. Scott talked about a moment in a script when he was reading that by, from, from Ron. And he's like, Oh, I, he, he was having problems with this one character in his story. And he realized I was not respecting him. I needed to, uh, I needed to treat him with more respect. And when I did that, he responded and he started coming to life. And that mm. part of the story became more rich. And so mm. I, I think all of these are just fancy ways of saying we're being active in mm. seeking uh, our subconscious, giving our subconscious a chance to weigh in. Yeah. Um, but I think the way that at that, ends up working in most of our brains is just treating them like people. Um, yeah. So for me, the way that I look at breaking down character development or how it fits into an arc is I just ask, well, what would you do next? Yeah. And, um, and I, they tend to usually have a good idea. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> no, I think that I think that, that is 100% true. I have some of the exact same notes myself. And um, it's interesting. I think that if you're writing a character that you just never figure out how to respect them, mm -hmm. it's probably because you're writing the wrong story that wasn't meant for you to tell in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, right? Like you, like you have no experience whatsoever with that thing that you're trying to speak on and you just shouldn't go there. Cause I remember Ryan Johnson saying, um, he was on a podcast and he was talking about um, the fact that if something has, has moved him, something has moved him emotionally uh that he needs to have um experienced that and then also realized what the antithesis of it was meaning that if he, if something angered him why did it anger him and why would the reverse of that be something he would need to play with as well right, right. like and um and i think that i think that that's so true like uh we just did a podcast on frozen one and two um and just 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 to articulate this point one of the things that Pixar does, I mean, Pixar is one of the best storytelling agencies there is out there, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and I was reflecting on this, the part of Elsa's character journey in the first film. You've seen Frozen, I assume? I have not seen the second one, but I have seen Frozen. Okay, no, we'll, just talk, we'll just talk about the first one right now. Um, in the first one, uh, Elsa has to realize who she, who she is. Mm -hmm. what, what is it that makes me me and I've hid this thing inside me for so long and, and 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 frozen is a lot about community right so Elsa decides I'm going to let it go and there's a whole song about let it go right um and I was reflecting on that and I was thinking to myself like 
So they did something with this film that's really magnificent from a storytelling perspective relative to its characters and their development. Mm -hmm. And that is that Elsa, when she sings that song, Let It Go, she then starts to create basically an attitude where she's putting herself above her community for, for a moment. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is she is, by letting her powers free, to their fullest extent without thought to the rest of her community, she creates an ice monster. <laughs> she creates an ice palace where she's isolated. And then she starts to create permanent winter for her community in Arendelle. Mm -hmm. And the storytellers play with that so well because they say, you know what? It's actually not good for this character to be isolated. It's not good for this character to just be all by herself, basically living out her full life, which she needs to figure out how to do is be herself in the context of her community. Mm -hmm. And that's the real message behind that. So I think it's always funny because we always will sing a song like Let It Go. And it's not that Let It Go is a bad song. It's not that the message of Let It Go is a bad message. But also the storytellers go, but beyond that, there's more to it. There's more nuance here. Um, and I think that that's really playing with the character and not trying to shove a message down somebody's throat. But like Brian Johnson saying, it's, I was angry. But can I be angry? This is his, his further thought on it. Can I be angry at myself for the same thing? Mm -hmm. Right? So I was angry about this in society, but what do I do to contribute to it? And then all of a sudden you have a fuller, more realized sort of character and the character development, I think can be a lot more realistic that way. So I love that. Yeah, love and, that. And, you, and this is why antagonists are so important because they're often testing different hypotheses as your, as your protagonist. Yep. Um, and I will often... I often, by the end of the story, I love my antagonist more than my protagonist. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that they've tested all the wrong hypotheses, uh, but I've come mm. to love them because they keep trying. Yes. You know, uh, they keep testing. And yeah. um, I think that is something that appeals to me just in life, in people, in situations. When someone just keeps trying, you know, mm -hmm. it's not about being perfect, but it's about trying. And so I think that's probably why I have kind of like a love affair with all my villains. Um, <laughs> yeah. they, I think they're, I think they're going about things wrong, but they're, they're committed to trying, yes. to, committed to figuring out, to having a because to the why. Yeah. Yeah, totally. In fact, to, to illustrate that point, we have our um, our full cast audio book and our novel that's coming mm -hmm. out pretty soon. And you can see the poster on it behind the wall. Um, and uh, when the villain was originally written, um, the, re the reason we had for why he was doing what he was doing um, was just not good enough, for lack mm -hmm. of a better way of describing it. It just wasn't, it wasn't making him fully human to the point where we understood what he, what he was going to do. We changed it. We gave him a reason. There's this really there's this, there's a scene where he where we see why he's doing what he's doing, and uh, when the actor got to that scene, the actor who's performing this full cast audiobook, when the actor got to that scene, it, we could tell that we finally nailed the character because he left the scene going, "Wow!" Like he got emotional. He got, he was completely like, "Now I know why this character is doing what he's doing. He does horrendous things." but I know why he's doing it. And I might do the same thing given this situation as well. And then we knew, we knew for a fact that like, that's it. That's, that's the character that makes sense because like you're saying, you can, you can start to fall in love with even their flaws of why they're doing what they're doing, but they're a fully realized person who might actually do those things. So I think that's fantastic. And it's, um, their, it's their commitment. They are usually committed from the beginning of the story uh, to trying to figure this thing out or, or, mm. or, or, or to saying that this is because to the why of life and the, your main character often has to be talked into even getting in the lab, you know, um, <laughs> 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 um, there tends to be different levels of commitment there. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. That's it for today's video. Special thanks again to Caleb Monroe for joining me today to talk about character development. If you have any questions for Caleb or I, please leave them in the comments down below and hit that like button for me while you get a chance. Plus on next week's video, we're gonna talk about character arcs, slightly different from character development. So make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss that content. If you wanna watch the full unedited two hour interview between myself and Caleb, then check out our Patreon account, patreon.com slash the story geeks. We would really appreciate your support. I'll see you on the next video.